thought it would come to this You say what's the use of trying again When all that we get are tears in the end be something we can do there must be something left here for me and you maybe it's not too late I'm not giving up, giving up on, our love. on our love no matter what no matter it means what. too much there must be something to say Well I can't remember the last time You held me that way One touch could chase away all my blues I want to break through this wall between us Find our way back to the way that it was Hi, I'm Rand Bishop. I'm Justina Kelly. I'm Haley Stout. And I'm Glendon Bishop. And you're watching Fire Pit Friday. How are you spending your Friday nights? Toasting your own marshmallows? Fire Pit need rekindling? Come on, join us every Friday night at the Fire Pit, where our conversation really heats up. Cynthia, this week on Fire Pit Friday, we're going to meet a man who gets paid for a living by making stuff up. I know. He calls his book a memoir, mm -hmm. or as he says, a name-dropping cautionary tale. How interesting. Well, anyway, Rand Bishop is going to be here, and I can't wait to meet him. I know. He's funny, mm -hmm. and I, I really think it's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Well, Fire Pit viewers, you're going to get an insider look at Rand Bishop, his life, and making stuff up. Here and now. All right, and who are we talking about? Rand Bishop, of course. Rand, welcome to Fire Pit Friday. It's Thank so great you. to see you tonight. Well, it's just fantastic to be here. Thank All right, ladies, Actually. welcome to Fire Pit Friday. Well, my name is Justina Kelly, and um, I'm a singer-songwriter from Nashville. Um, I actually live in Los Angeles right now. And I come warm and toasty. That's right. Well, actually, it's been kind of cold there. I, I heard that it snowed out in Malibu. <gasps> wow. A couple of weeks ago. Yeah, it was kind of oh, crazy. Oh, wow. All right, well, so now like you're warm by the fire right pit, there, right? <laughs> it snowed in, in Malibu. Malibu. Snowed in Malibu. Mm -hmm. I know. And your name is? I'm Haley Stout. I'm a singer-songwriter here in Nashville, too. And I moved here from Oregon, um, Portland area. Wow. And uh, to work with Rand. Oh. Haley came to Nashville in uh, January, two years ago, as the... Uh, one of the finalists in the Colgate Country Music Showdown. And very cool. He started mm -hmm. with 50,000 comp competitors, and she ended up being a very close runner-up, second that place. That close to $100,000. Wow. So I have to tell everybody. Oh, I'm awesome. like, oh. <laughs> well, Speaking I'm, of family. There you go. I'm Glendon Bishop. I'm Rand's daughter. Um, I go to National School of the Arts. That's fantastic. Yeah. And are you going? You're into singing and songwriting yeah, and all of that. And acting and oh, see that's so fantastic. So you're kind of following in Dad's in footsteps. great company. So, yeah, so has out. everybody yeah. adopted the um, making stuff up? Yes. Oh, I bought it like the first day it came out. Really? Yes. Okay. <laughs> of course, it came out on my birthday actually. This is awesome. Yeah, I ran. It was released in honor of Justine. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, he did it for you. Yeah. Yeah. He forgot to give me a little. He's making that up. <laughs> stop it! Stop it! I got caught oh, again. Oh, that cleverness. 
<laughs> no, we made we made a couple notes, yeah, and we yeah. are pretty pretty interested in uh, this this piece here. Now, this is a work this is a work in development. You've been working on this for a long time, a lifetime, I'd say, wouldn't you say? Well, it's, it certainly is somewhat of a culmination of a lifetime of work. Yeah. Right. Forty years in the music business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're talking about um, making stuff up, which is Rand's book that I. It's very funny. Yeah, very it's funny. really funny, and anybody in Nashville is so going to get it. It's kind of a lesson of how not to do it to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's yes. really good. Yeah, now yeah. I know why you're the yeah, producer. Right. See that? Are you, are you going to use that in your next book? Because I'd like Yes, that. I, I am. Like Could that. you write yeah. that down like for me? Yes. Well, actually, please, I'm, yes. I'm actually going to see this podcast. Yes. I can yes. probably do There you go. Yeah. yeah. It's like <laughs> help you. Yeah, let me to help, help you. To help me. To help me. I have another subtitle for the book, which is How to Shoot Yourself Repeatedly in the Foot and Still Get Up Dancing. There you go. You know what? If it wasn't so long, that would have been really good. You know what rings true is just the no boundary sort of thing. Thing, and mm-hmm. also keep going, keep going, keep going, mm-hmm. and be persistent and consistent. Yes. And that seems to have been your your song, your song throughout the years. Mm-hmm. Never give up, Mm-mm. right? Never give up. Like yeah. that little boy mm-hmm. said to that's, you. That's, that's, that's so you it. know, at least I read the end of the book. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> you Which have you know? a, a fabulous hit out with Toby Keith. Well, it actually came out in 2002. Uh, the record was uh, was released in shortly after 9-11 and it was it turned out to be kind of an anthem for that year Mm -hmm. uh, for the country music uh, market and uh, we got such it was a a five-week number one and and Uh. and about the April and May of that year Um, and it's a song about life's priorities Mm -hmm. and you know when after a disaster of that kind, people mm. started reevaluating their lives and really thinking about what's important. We had mm-hmm. written it actually two years before that. So we weren't trying to take mm. advantage of that particular situation. And in, as a matter of fact, when Toby cut that song, I had retired from the music business. I was completely out of the music business. Mm-hmm. And I, had, I was building a business outside the music business and the success of that song kind of brought me kicking and screaming back into the music business, I was able to uh, open my own music business, my own music publishing company mm-hmm. on, on Music Row and uh, begin working with uh, some talented young people and mm-hmm. a couple of them are right here. I can see yeah. that. I can see that. That m- may have been in quote, please tell me if I'm wrong, but just taking that experience, that's your pinnacle, mm-hmm. to give back. To be able to put yourself in a in a position where you have made this wonderful title of n- hit hit songwriter, mm-hmm. and then being um, and giving back to and cultivating art as well. Well, as anybody who reads the book will will understand that I did go through the same kind of anxieties and the same kind of growing pains that that th- that oh, yeah. these these girls are going through now. You know. And I made every single mistake you can possibly make. Made I had every single opportunity. I had more opportunities than most people would expect in ten lifetimes. Mm. And when you're in your twenties, uh, even into your early thirties, you have this feeling that you're bulletproof. That you that that you're always going to have another opportunity. And the fact is, that in this day and age, the investment that's involved in in launching a career is so great that you really aren't going to have that many opportunities. So right. part, of the, part of what I've, I'm trying to accomplish with this book is to give young artists an opportunity to see what kind of mistakes you can make okay. and try to avoid them. Um, I I'm, I'm going to quote um, a, a, something that a, a reviewer wrote. <laughs> Rand Bishop looks good in tights. We and can sing too. We, yeah. And you know what? I had a pair of tights yeah. that I was going to bring in. Just really? As she was introducing, I was going to go, Rand. Do tights mean anything to you? Do you have a picture of that? I don't. Turn it! Don't. My mother may have one. But you know, this I'm, was intriguing. Yeah. Well, I, I was actually, and I like to say that I was like this, I, I, I chose two completely unlikely careers. And I had no backup plan. It was one or the other. I was either going to be an actor, mm-hmm. stage actor. I wanted to be a serious stage actor. Or I was going to be a rock and roll star. I mean, those were my two career choices. So I was kind of like the six-year-old yeah. girl, you know, who says, uh, "I want to be a princess and a ballerina." Yeah. So, I, I very little time of mine was required at rehearsals because I only had a couple of small speaking parts, you know, in in the shows. So I was picking and grinning in my little apartment, you know, writing songs about how lonely and alienated I was. And I went to 
the owner of uh, this coffee shop mm -hmm. at the edge of the creek there in mm -hmm. Ashland, Oregon. And I said, how about you let me come in and play some songs after mm -hmm. one of the plays gets out? And he, mm -hmm. he allowed me to do that. And a lot of the people from the company, from the theatrical company, came in. Instead of going right to the pub, which is theater tradition, mm -hmm. they came in. And after my set, when I was collecting about $15 in coins and, and, and bills from a past hat, this director said, why do you want to be an actor when you can sing? Ding! <laughs> <laughs> now, you said that this is a life lesson here. Can you th think of your top number one, oops, I'd never do that again moment? Or are they just a necessary uh, accumulation of, of necessary evils? And well, I don't know whether I would have said what I said to Clive Davis. Oh, yes. We wanted to talk to you about that. Um, do, you want me, do you want me to remind you what you said? That's, That's showbiz, showbiz, Clive. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's talk hear it. Come on now. Your throat and then run yourself over with the ambulance that's taking that's, your body that's out. Right. Uh. <laughs> well, I, like I said, when you're in your 20s, you think you'll always have another opportunity. And... Uh, Clive Davis was very kind to me. He gave me a lot of his time. I played him a lot of songs over a two-year period or so, or so, and he offered me uh, contracts on two different occasions. Uh, both times I felt as though I wasn't given enough creative autonomy. Uh, I was, at, at that point in time, had al already established myself uh, when I was living in Canada as a, a singer, a songwriter, and a producer. and so. Clive had different ideas mm -hmm. because he really doesn't feel like artists should be self-produced. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when he introduced me to the guy that he intended to be my producer, which was uh, somebody who I had a great deal of respect for, Harry Maslin, who had produced th uh, two fantastic David Bowie albums, Station to Station and um, what was the other That's one? That's pretty uh, huge. Young Americans. And I idolized Bowie and sure. I thought, you know, Harry Maslin, this is fantastic. And I said, Oh, Clive, you mean co-producer, don't you? Whoops. And, yeah. and he, <clears throat> Clive, looked at me and he said, Excuse me? Oh, oh, oh. And I said, Well, you know, I produced all those demos you like so much. And he said, Well, those were demos. Those weren't masters, those were demos. Well, mm -hmm. I, you know, my ego couldn't take that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I said, Well, I can't make records if I can't be involved in the production. He, and he, he did this thing where he, he used to wear these glasses that were this big. And he took them off, and he cleaned them very carefully while he was thinking about what he was, how he was going to respond. And he mm -hmm. said, and I can't make records with an artist with your attitude. <laughs> and I could have, wow. at that point, saved my ass. I could have. I could have apologized. Okay, I could have so said, there's your turning point. I could point. have been contrite. Mm -hmm. I could have said, you know maybe down the line, right. you know, and I do have aspirations to be a producer, but, you know, Harry's great, and, you know, I'd mm -hmm. love to work with you. Yes. But that's when I said, that's showbiz, Clyde. Yeah, no, I think I would have done the same what thing. What a great story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a great story. But, you know, I have to give you kudos for having the moxie to do something like that um, because you believed in yourself. Okay, and that's not such a bad thing. It's just uh, picking and choosing the moment, the battle. Yeah, yeah, that's hard to do. I think. Well, everybody goes through that just in normal life. Yeah. Come on, with your boss or with your spouse, or you have to pick and choose the battle because if you're constantly fighting or trying to win, sometimes you you might miss an opportunity. And it is Clive Davis. Yeah, yeah, and it is. <laughs> yeah. It's Clive Davis. Well, yeah. I, I think it's funny that your book really is kind of the, a theme to. It ain't over till the fat, even when the fat lady sings, it ain't over. Yeah. Because then you went on after that and you still had success. So mm -hmm. now since then, I'm just curious, have you ever met him since then? And does he remember I, that? I haven't. And as a matter of fact, I reached out to him uh, asking him to do a foreword for my book. And I know he got my letter and I, I wrote it very carefully mm -hmm. and I was very contrite. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I think he's pretty much, I burnt that bridge. Yeah, and, that, you uh, blew that bridge I, up. I blew, I, I <laughs> destroyed that bridge. You know, so, you know, you do pick your battles, you Cece, do. but, yeah. you know, I may have picked a few that I might have, I might have not been the, I, I, I was the mouse that roared, but uh, mm -hmm. I think maybe I was under somebody's heel at that moment, so. <laughs> 
Um, and I why? think he came up in a time too when there were like a lot of artists that are now like legends. Mm. Like um, I like well, I love the seventies era. Yeah, and mm. Glenn Personally Fry and Hoot Night at the Troubadour. Hoot Night at the Troubadour. What was that about? Uh, Monday nights at the Troubadour in the early seventies <coughs> was an opportunity for the denim-clad, shag-haired uh, um, acoustic music scene to have an opportunity to get up there and play a couple songs for industry people and mm -hmm. for, for, the, for, the, for the real devotees of, the, of that genre. And, and people like uh, uh, Jackson Brown would mm -hmm. be there and J.D. Souther and, and uh, Bernie Ledden and from the Eagles, mm -hmm. the original Eagles. Um, and there was a group called the Dillards who were very influential. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, they pretty much created what became country rock even before the Birds did. Uh, it was a, a bluegrass group from northern Missouri in mm -hmm. the Ozark Mountains. And uh, so there was this core group of people who would perform on Monday nights. And I was part of what had basically our, my band, which was on Electra Records, a, a group called Roxy, one the 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 drummer had become decided to quit the band to become a jazz musician and to kind of get away from all of the girls he had promised he would marry <laughs> so he moved back to northern california and then the keyboard player became he was walking down hollywood boulevard one day and, they, and these guys said come here let's would you like to have a personality test <laughs> well about two months later he was trying to become clear as a scientologist so he was no longer interested in Oops. in in uh being in the band right. and our guitar player who was brilliant was kind of content to sit in front of the television with a bottle of wild turkey and a pack of lark oh, cigarettes what a waste of and time. play solitaire and so the two singer songwriters in the band ended up being a duo wow. and so we'd go to the troubadour and bob segarini and myself every monday night and there was another duo that was kind of our competitors and that was glenn fry and jd souther and they had a group called long long branch penny whistle so there was Segarini and Bishop, and there was Long Branch Penny Muscle. Well, Glenn, who was from Detroit, you know, a country mission, musician from Detroit, which is kind <laughs> of interesting, he, f he kind of considered himself the uncrowned prince of the Troubadour Bar. And, and he would come in every Monday night, and he'd come in and he'd kind of allow his eyes to adjust to the darkness, and he'd look around and he'd look for the prettiest face in the bar. <laughs> Well, on one rare Monday night, I brought in my live-in girlfriend who ended up becoming my first wife. And we, were, we got there early, and we were sitting there by the stained glass windows that were on the edge of Santa Monica Boulevard, and we were sitting there, and Glenn came in. Uh -oh. And he uh -oh. saw my, my girlfriend, Melanie. Uh -oh. And he barely acknowledged mm. me. And he came up, and he slid up next to her on the mm -hmm. bench, and he put his arm around her, mm -hmm. and he said, What's your sign? Well, evidently she'd heard that line before. Uh -huh. And she looked at him and she said, asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> I, like <laughs> I was laughing so hard I had beer shooting out of my mouth. Do you span? You go through different different eras of mm -hmm. music and you go from the rock and roll, you go, you have 70s, you have all these influences. Well, I, th I thought the recordings and the quality of the music in the, in the early to mid 70s was really, really strong. Mm -hmm. Uh, I produced a lot of records in the ha in the hair band eras of, of the eight, 80s, and when I when I kind of listen back to that stuff, I I'm a not so bit. sure I really love that stuff. Yeah. And to to a certain degree, that was kind of a repetitive process. But the 70s, there's something about. I mean, can we bring the 70s music back? Yeah, I know that. Well, like, some people want to hit me over the head when yeah. I say that. I honestly think that there's a lot of that energy going on in music today. I think that there's a lot of very organic. Um, stuff that's derived from the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, you and Cece have um, a common thread. We do. We do. Different we times, do. Different but... Time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is my common thread to your um, Richie Havens. Yeah. I met oh. Richie in New York, and he wrote, he wrote to me, to Colleen, a friend forever, Richie Haven. Working with Richie was <laughs> one of the most emotional experiences I've ever had <laughs> as a writer, and of course, I admired him and his vocal instrument mm -hmm. for so long. I mean, this was his the guy playing. that sang mm -hmm. uh, "Motherless Child" at Woodstock. You know, this this and this phenomenal style of 
of strumming the open string guitar yeah, and you that were voice, yeah. you know, just... Yeah, he's very powerful yeah. and, and very, um, oh, he's in the zone. Mm-hmm. He just gets in the zone, and that's his element. But even off stage, I mean, just speaking with him, very calm oh, yeah. and laid back and just in the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, very nice, very yeah. nice person. Well, we went to New York. I, 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 you know, got to the point to where I really wanted to apply my talent to something meaningful. But I, I really wanted to use the gifts that I'd been given to do something that, that would make a better world. And mm-hmm. so uh, a couple of partners and I started a not-for-profit called Songwriters and Artists for the Earth. And mm-hmm. our first album, which took probably two and a, two to two and a half years to put together, Richie mm-hmm. was part of. And we wrote a song called Light of the Sun, which was kind of a world beat song. And we used uh, a group, an uh, acapella group called Rockapella. Now they're most famous for singing the theme to uh, Where in the World is Carmen? San Diego. San Diego. Yeah. Uh, they were on that show. They mm-hmm. were the, kind of the, the musical muse of that show. Mm-hmm. But they were a wonderful group, and they did this kind of Lady Smith Mombasso chant mm-hmm. in, in back of the song. And then Richie came in to sing the lead vocal. And when he walked into the studio, it was it was messianic. You know, this, there was this guy, like it was this, this imp- grand he's presence. Big, he's a big guy. He's a big, and he was wearing all of those bangles around yeah. his neck like Big hands. Like, his hands are enormous. Enormous, yeah. And so I always thought he was little. No, no, he's, a, no, he's, he's big, a, he's big, a big guy. Big, big, tall, and very grand. Yeah. And he's wearing kind of a caftan, sort of a African sort of Like outfit. a dashiki thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we say, you know, you want to run through the song? You know, he says, no, no, I'm ready. <laughs> and he walks out into the studio and he takes off these beads and bangles and wooden carved mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm. one strand at a time, yep. puts the headphones on, stands in front of the microphone, we roll the tape, and he nails it on the first take. And as soon yeah. as he came out with that first line, with this rich voice that sounds like it's literally coming from the center of the earth, it's mm-hmm. just so mm-hmm. rich and powerful, tears came streaming down my face. Yeah. Here I've I written a song about solar power. You know, it was, it was about, you know, doing something to, to help save our planet, you know, mm-hmm. and the album was for the benefit of, of Earth Island Institute and Save the Children. Mm-hmm. And to hear this guy that I admired so much mm-hmm. singing the words and music that I had Girl created, had created yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and sing it so beautifully mm-hmm. and so powerfully, it's just... It's moving. Yeah, it's, it, you know, and I, I had some great experiences in the studio watching uh, uh, Ann Wilson from Heart singing one of my songs and... and, and and you know the, the guys from Cheap Trick performing my songs, and and singing with the Beach Boys in the studio. But this thing with Richie, it really, I think, it was probably the most moving moment that I've ever had. Wow. Yeah. that's a fabulous story. The thing to... is that one of the main reasons song ex- songs exist at all is because they're emotional. Mm-hmm. They they communicate emotionally more so than they do intellectually. Mm-hmm. And unless a song is emotional, it's never going to be effective. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't affect people. In that core, and that's true of all great entertainment. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's true of great movies and great novels and, mm-hmm. and anything. It's all about connecting with people on an emotional mm-hmm. level. Now, we intellectualize a lot about it when mm-hmm. we're creating it, mm-hmm. but in, in the essence of it in the long run is mm-hmm. do we connect to the heart? I'd love to sing a song. Yes, yes, please. When the calm becomes the storm. Your soul is frayed and warm, and your heart catches a chill, and you think you've lost the will to live another day alone in a house that's not a home. There is courage to be found, though the thunder shakes the ground, and the calm becomes the storm. I'll be there, the sun is free and warm. I'll be there, the calm becomes the storm. You're not alone when the lightning strikes. You're not alone when the bitter wind blows and cuts right through you like the shark.
I try to mm -hmm. help a young artist with is to find who they are mm -hmm. and to really work on the work on the strengths and to expand those strengths and to kind of push aside the weaknesses right. and to uh, to hide them. Okay. You know. so this is a song about uh, uh, from the point of view of a woman who's really standing up for herself. because we took your words to heart mm -hmm. and we applied the lessons in your book mm -hmm. and um, we've written a song. No kidding. Using for your you. steps for, for you. you. <laughs> and, we, and we want to do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> now after hearing all of you sing, frankly, I have to be honest and have a disclaimer here. I cannot sing, never claim to, but I'm going for it. Here we go. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> I think I can work with an artist with your attitude. That's, That's showbiz, Rand. <laughs> <laughs>